The Battle of Waterloo. Since the guns fell silent in Belgium over 200 years ago, this event has gained an iconic status. Few other events in military history have become the focus of pop songs or turned into everyday phrases, like having met your Waterloo. Unsurprisingly, the battle has been depicted in multiple times in cinema, meaning that Ridley Scott's portrayal is nothing new. Trenches, the Prussians arriving on the wrong side of the battlefield, Ney losing his mind, forgetting all tactical awareness and charging headlong into infantry. These are not inventions by Ridley. They are actually old tropes that have appeared on screen before. Tonight, one of the few people to have actually dug trenches on the battlefield of Waterloo, the respected conflict archaeologist Professor Tony Pollard, tells us all about the long and chequered history of big screen retellings of the Napoleonic era's most famous battle. From Nazi Napoleons to collapsing sets, from the debate on exploding round shot to the guard dying but never surrendering, we explore the dramas of more than a century of the Battle of Waterloo appearing on the big screen. We discuss what went wrong in the Ridley Scott depiction, how the way in which the battle is shown has developed over time, and what we might hope for from Kubrick's screenplay currently resting in the hands of Steven Spielberg. This is Waterloo, the battle on the big screen. Up next on the Napoleonic Wars pod. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to the Napoleonic Wars pod, where as you've heard from that introduction, we are going to go hell for leather in tearing apart some of the great depictions of Waterloo. Joining me is one of the few people to have actually dug trenches on the Waterloo battlefield, Tony Pollard, Professor of Conflict History and Archaeology at the University of Glasgow, lead academic and a field director at the brilliant charity Waterloo Uncovered, and a guy who is renowned for his TV work, including Nazi megastructures. Tony, great to see you. You're rapidly becoming Professor Waterloo at this point. Um, I, I can't really think of many people who can hold a, a flame to you when it comes to this. Good to see you. How are you doing? I'm good. No, I am. I'm. I'm. I'm pretty good. I, I just started to leave, and I've got a big. I've got a big chunk of time ahead of me, which I can spend writing stuff. So I'm very happy. Um, but yeah, I, I guess. I guess the Waterloo thing. Obviously, there's the Waterloo uncovered connection. But I, I. I was looking back. We've been doing that project with military veterans since 2015. Funnily enough, and um, we're coming up for our tenth year very soon, probably next year, um, given when we actually started thinking about it. And I was just trying to work out how much time I've actually spent on Waterloo Battlefield. It is now months, literally feet on the ground at Waterloo. So I, I guess, I, I, as far as landscape's concerned, I should know what I'm talking about. Um, the same can't be said of, of Ridley Scott, unfortunately, but I'm sure we'll get there. <laughs> Well, what tell you what, why don't we just dive right in? Before we do dive right in, I do just want to do a, a bit of a shout out to Waterloo Uncovered, a fantastic organisation that's using archaeology as part of veteran rehabilitation, um, does some amazing work um, with many individuals. Um, and it's not just about the digs, of course, it's about that wider support structure that goes into it. So folks, I'm going to put links in the descriptions to this. Please do follow through and donate if you can. Ridley okay. Scott. We mentioned trenches already. Um, now, I'd imagine you've done a bit of um, ground surveying work, geophys and all the rest of it. So I'm guessing you would know <laughs> if um, somebody had randomly dug a trench for no obvious bloody reason when we it comes to, to Waterloo. Let's get your reactions to everything, including the telescopic rifles, which did make me howl. Well, I, the whole thing is, uh, let, let's just take a step back and, and kind of contextualize my, my take on Napoleon. Like everybody else, I was quite excited about this. This is a, this is a rare event, um, a, a big, big picture release from the Napoleonic period is, 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 is a bit special. So, and it's Ridley Scott. I love Ridley Scott. You know, Blade Runner and Alien are uh, probably within my top 10 movies of all time. Um, funnily enough, I'm not a massive fan of Gladiator, but that you might, me. 
tell us something. But anyway, so I was quite excited. And, and there was a lot of excitement, um, social media wise, even with the release of the trailer. And I thought I'm not going to get sucked in here because people were people were already throwing brick bats at the depiction of Austerlitz and such like. And I thought I'll wait to go and see it. And being a bit of a rebel, I thought, or as I see myself, I thought, right, the historian community obviously hates this. Um, Ridley Scott has has responded rather trenchantly and said, "Get a life." Um, I, I I read yesterday that was directed at Dan Snow. It was. Uh, he also taught historians to fuck off, which was an well, interesting that's, one. Well, that's, that's, there are times. <laughs> um, but, but so I thought, right, everybody hates it. I'm going to go in and I'm going to love it. And uh, I hated it. It was, it was, it got to the point that the, the, the issue was um, I, I can live with playing fast and loose with history. I've written a historical novel about Isambard Kingdom Brunel, which works around reality, but is is basically a gothic thriller. Um, I've worked on I've worked on movies and TV shows as a historical advisor, um, so I, I can I can live with that. I understand how fiction works, and I I I kind of get its relationship to history. So I was I was set for that, but the the film's problem was I found it boring. And once I found it boring, which was probably half an hour in, um, with two hours still to go, I started to entertain myself picking holes in it. And once that had started, the whole facade just came collapsing down like, you know, those pyramids. And um, and it was terrible. And I, and, I, and I thought, oh, here we go. I've just got to, you know, I've got to form square with the rest of them now. There's, there's no there's no way I can polish this turd. Um and we'll get to Waterloo, but Waterloo was the, the the veritable straw that broke the camel's back. And I was looking forward to some scenes with Napoleon on the back of a camel. We didn't get that. Um, and artistic license is fine. And the pyramid bit, well, the pyramid bit, what was that about? We've got the Battle of the Pyramids. We all know that they were, the battle took place miles away from the pyramids. Uh, but it's 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 a well known de pictorial device that the pyramids feature in the in the battle as a background. So we've got we've got a Mameluk army um, at the base of the pyramids. Napoleon um, looking like the Roman emperor he used to be, you know, orders his cannons to fire, and the, and they and the thing was he shoots at two pyramids, and I'm thinking, is this is this a reference to the two ta to the twin towers? What's what's going on here? And it was kind of it was kind of that um, pop at ancient culture in Egypt. But then I thought, well, if that's if that is symbolism, your your army that you're facing, the Mamluk army, has nothing to do with ancient Egypt. It's essentially a European army um, with with a lot of twists and turns in it. So it, I. I if if it was symbolism, I, it was it was lost on me. It was I was quite surprised that there were two. I wasn't expecting the two hits against the pyramids, and then basically was it a, one one of the Mamluks falls off a horse, and that's basically it. I think the idea is that the Mamluk commander gets hit by falling masonry from the pyramid, <laughs> it's, um, it's... drops dead, and the entire army just runs away or vaporizes that's... or something. That's a, because I was quite looking forward to the Battle of the Pyramids. It's a stunning yeah. battle, yeah. cavalry action against Square. It's it's phenomenal. He he could have he could have blown Bundachuk away with that single scene, but he turns it into a, I thought a quite iffy, um, if we're if we're looking at the the cultural and and, and race background of what what's happening there. I I, I found it fairly unpleasant. Then, um, and I definitely didn't want to go here. I definitely didn't want to have to put my archaeologist hat on. But then we have the savants with the pyramids and the pharaoh and the scene where he, he talks or does whatever it is with the Starts pharaoh. And stroking the pharaoh's cheek. And it's, all very, of, it's all very odd. But it's all very uncomfortable, isn't it? It's Even the, what I must say is, is the actors in that scene, I'm pretty sure no acting was required for that <laughs> because they're all there going, what the hell even is this? And yeah. actually, that, that's exactly how everyone feels when they see that scene. 
And I, I, there was the whole scene. It was the they appeared to be in a a big tunnel that had been dug in a quarry underneath a pyramid. And I'm going as an archaeologist. I'm going. Wait a minute. What 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 is that? What what's that hole they've dug? They've dug a tunnel under the. And then I, as I always do, and I might even mention Poirot later. But you know when you watch Agatha Christie and they've got an excavation on, and there's there's all the all the indigenous people in the background that have, you know, been forced basically to do, to do the labor of, of the, the colonialist archeologists. And, and they're usually doing absolutely pointless tasks. This was the most pointless background action on an archeological dig I've ever seen. I mean, it literally just was. And I just thought this, this is, this is fairly, fairly poor stuff. So it failed on the archeology span as well as the, as the battle scenes. And it went on and it went on. And you get you get really you get really bored of that grey blue and you just go, oh God, come on. And Austerlitz, yeah, fine. I, I could live with the ice. I could really live with the ice. It's not the you first know, so could I. to show and, the ice. And people were being really clever. This is the thing. We expected something clever, right? You know, maybe this is the yeah. whole thing from Napoleon's perspective. Maybe it's I don't know Napoleon's career in retrospect. Yeah. And he's talking How about he remembered his... it. Yeah, and that's great. There's a point to be made there. Some really intelligent yeah. points to be made there. But it was just oh, <laughs> Auslitz was Auslitz was almost as bad as Waterloo. I expected Auslitz to be worse than Waterloo, yeah. and was yeah. unpleasantly surprised. But for me, it's it's those moments where you've got Wacky and Phoenix going take their position on the high ground, and then the infantry just jump out of their trenches. What is it with trenches and Ridley Scott? And then charge frontally into a melee in the middle of a valley. You just sort of think yeah. that that's sloppy yeah. editing, more than anything else. It's just it was just it was just a mess. And then obviously, by the time we got to Waterloo, um, I was in pretty bad humour. Fortunately, I was in a luxury seat. I, I went at ten o'clock or eleven o'clock in the morning in a, in a relatively new cinema in the the, the middle of Glasgow, and uh, there were there were no more than twenty of us in it. And it was great. And I had one of these big recliners. It was like first class um, uh, air, air, air flight. Anyway, so we got to Waterloo, and that was, as I said, the, the straw that broke the camel's back. It was it was just atrocious from beginning to end. And I thought by then, Ridley Scott is deliberately here taking the piss. He's got to be. That there are there is so much basic information about Waterloo that it is impossible to make such a lash of it, surely. Um, and as we'll come to, even Sharp manages to put on a better front with six people and a dog. You know, it's just, it's just atrocious. So where, where, where do we start? The digging of the trenches was a, a red rag to a bull, I'm sure with you. Um, in no of the accounts I've read, does the French or Wellington's army dig in. Um, you know, so, I, I almost tried to be generous and go, has somebody tried to communicate the concept of the sunken lane to him? This was where he balls it up. But this is where I then, went with it. This was this was what I was kind of thinking. Oh, is this a reference to because just behind, I think, if I remember rightly, just behind the French trench that they were actively digging. There was there was the road. And then behind that, there was a tented city. <laughs> <laughs> and. And it was just, it was just insane. So you've got, you've got Wellington on his, on his ridge, dug in with Chevaux de Frey. And yeah, the, the fact that the battlefield had been picked because of the sunken way, the reverse slope, the farms to the front. No, we're, we're just going to dig, we're just going to dig trenches and turn it into the Western front. And you've got, and this is this this is this is where I've done the, to, to use the uh, the archaeological metaphor. I've I've done a bit of digging on depictions of Waterloo, and there are certain tropes that appear in the movies. And and one of them, obviously, and we've all seen Bondarchuk's nineteen seventy masterpiece, and we will call it that. There are others that disagree, but we'll get there. Um, there's the bit where the artillery officer says, "Shall I? I've got." Napoleon in my sights shall I take a shot at him and that's not the first time that happens in movies there's a, a British film from the 1930s that we'll discuss later where it happens and then the French shoot back and Wellington says 
I always said Napoleon was no gentleman. But uh, it's that generals have better things to do than shoot at one another. So this is where Poirot comes in, I guess. So what does this film do? It has a 95th rifleman, I assume it's a 95th rifleman, um, with a rifle, fair enough, um, on a bipod, with a telescopic sight, which appears to be a, t- a telescope tied to the weapon. Just lashed to the damn thing. Just lashed to the weapon. Um, I mean, that was that was pure Terry Gilliam. Um, and, and he's got, he can see Napoleon in his tent, no less. And he says, can I take a pot shot? And, and then Wellington says something like, under pain of death, no, you will not. And, and kind of does a take on the line. And uh, the, the scene with the rifleman, um, and does he take a shot? This is what really pisses me off. He goes right, and we'll takes get, that we'll bloody shot. We'll get to you being pissed off because he's clearly broken the rules and you don't like rule breakers. Um, so uh, this is this is where the Poirot bit comes in. So you've got you've got all of these Poirot movies, which I really enjoy. Peter Ustinov, Albert Finney, um, the TV iterations. And then you've got Kenneth Branagh who comes in and says, right, I'm going to I'm going to remake what are pretty masterful movies. The, the Peter Ustinov version of uh, Death on the Nile is superb. And. Uh, he does it and it's it he comes in a new broom new sheriff in town these are my rules we're going to change stuff about cuz i can't do what's gone before so we get the stupid mustache that's all over the face we get all of the ridiculous setup so one of my favorites is um murder on the orient express where in the in the traditional versions obviously for because they're stuck in a snowdrift. Most of the scenes are inside the train. But no, Branagh has to take it out of the train. And at one point, he's interviewing a a potential suspect, a female potential suspect, at a table with a coffee pot, both sat there on a glacier, basically. And they haven't even given the... You can't see the breath or anything. And you just think, you've only done that because you want... and And then you've got the denouement where... It's all of the suspects together, and that's usually done in the restaurant car or wherever on the train. But no, it's done in the mouth of a tunnel. So it looks like Charles Dickens's, you know, ghost stories at Christmas signalman, just with with the Last Supper thrown in. It's just ridiculous. And this is exactly what Ridley Scott has done. He's gone, that's all been done before. I don't care whether that was closer to the actuality than what I propose, but I'm not doing it the same way. And I, I think that's part of the problem here. He's decided deliberate decision to just do it differently. And he almost will get we'll get to we'll get to we'll mention this again when we get to the squares, but you you pitch in about your dissatisfaction with Yeah, that. It, it's the that would be fine as long as you actually apply some logic to it. But there are two issues with this stupid telescopic rifle monstrosity. One is strapping a telescope to a rifle doesn't increase the range of the damn thing. You probably know the the distance between. I the can two tell you, I worked it. I, I, I did it on Google Earth. Of course, I did. As soon as I got home, but, but it's it's what it's the it, it, a it's mile something like that from 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 the um, sand pit, which let's say is the most okay. forward position yeah. of the ninety fifth rifles opposite Le Haisson. Two, for the sake of argument, the building at, at Le Belle Alliance mm-hmm. is over 1,300 yards. So if you had a Barrett rifle, fine. <laughs> you'd, be, you'd be all right. You know, you, you'd need some skill, but you, you could make that shot. Yeah. But the other thing was you've got Wellington, known for being... And okay, people don't know this if they're not a crime and punishment nerd like me, but we're going there because I haven't had this rant properly. Um, You've got Wellington, who is an ultra strict disciplinarian. This is a guy who is quite happy to sign off on executions. He turns around his rifleman and says he cannot take that shot on pain of death. Three minutes later, he takes the shotting shot regardless. Just, just come on. That's, that's, it's 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 shit. It's, it's, it's... And and I can't remember now something that is interesting, and I 
I quite appreciate this. What we're doing now is all very old school because we saw a film at the cinema, not on pay for view or Netflix or wherever, at our at our you know, and 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 with the ability to watch it again. We saw it at the cinema, and there's, there's I, I was invited back to the cinema this week by a friend to go and see it, and uh, there was no way Wild Horses would not drag me to another two and a half hour viewing of that film. But all we've got, and because I, I love this thing, I, I love this 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 broken memory thing, which is all we've we've already touched upon it with with battle and and reminiscing. Um, what do you remember, and what do you forget? And I, there are certain bits of Waterloo from the film that are etched on my retinas, the rifle scene being one of them, though I couldn't remember the actual... I mean, does it go into the tent? Is it is it close to hitting Napoleon? No, so by this point, he's ridden forward with the cavalry, oh. Um, oh. which is a whole other thing. Napoleon deciding to lead a, a second cavalry charge. Oh, oh. Um, so, and then, so the, the bullet goes through his hat. Oh, of um, course, it goes through the the side yeah. of his butt. Oh, it's astounding! I, d- I don't remember that on the recently sold one that went. I think for almost, what was it, two million dollars, one point nine million dollars, yeah. or something, to a South Korean. Somebody decided to cash in big time, didn't they? Oh, it's 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 yeah, absolutely. That's when to cash in your chips. That one. So so I I I don't even remember. I don't remember Ugamo appearing. Somebody said you could see it burning in the background. I I don't I don't remember that. What I do remember, and again, this is this goes back to this Poirot thing, um, Poirot syndrome, where the British, this is where it gets really silly, the British come forward of their dug-in positions onto the forward slope. Um, the, cav- the French cavalry charge at them, so they've exposed themselves in line, and then they then go into square, having exposed themselves. Now, what Ridley Scott does at that moment is quite good. He's he's obviously again gone right. Vunderchuk, the most famous scene probably in in war movie history, is the aerial shot of the charge, French charge against the British, uh, against Wellington Squares. And so he's decided, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to show a square being formed. Great. Fabulous, but you do it under such ridiculous circumstances that it just makes a mockery of it. And then it's a tiny square. Yeah. And I, I, I think I actually laughed at the scene where the Carassias are whizzing around like the horses on a merry-go-round against this around this tiny square. And yeah, we love lack of CGI. That's great. That's why we all love the 1970 movie. But you know, if you don't have the Red Army at, at your command and control, then it just doesn't. It, it was very. I have to say that bit was very sharp. The the mm. lack of the lack of personnel in in costume. Yes. <laughs> so that that really that was really it for me. I'd I'd kind of lost it by then. So I, I can't remember how the battle ends or. Um, I mean, what? How does? Because Ney looks nothing like we understand Ney to look like, did he? I didn't realize that was Ney until the Waterloo sequence. That's that's <laughs> yeah. how. That's how, But this is the problem with the marshals generally. You've got these people who are so integral to Napoleon's success. Yeah. Who were just sort of they're there in the background, sort of looking sheepish, and yeah. the actors are clearly desperate to say something because they're yeah. being hired, and and it's it's yeah. just absurd. And uh, Juno is there just to tell him bad stuff about Josephine. I mean, it was just, and and I love the way I, I love the way I, Josephine had a lot of power in that film, but it was all it was all very much the male gaze and all of that stuff. But you know, it was Josephine that he left Egypt for. It was it, it, she was she was the driver for all of his major actions. He leaves Elba just, for Josephine, he left Elba. yeah, despite the fact that she's actually dead. Before Napoleon makes the decision to leave in reality. And uh, you can, this is the point. Where do you have your red line? What yeah. is that ultimate line in the sand where you just go, this is utterly appalling? Yeah. And, and, and history's and, the excuse for me. This is historical fantasy and not yeah. biopic. It might have well have been, it should have just made it steampunk and be done with it. Yes. It, it, it's just, I could have lived with a lot, but it, and I, I've only just 
in, in some respects, in preparation for our conversation, read the reviews, and everybody's pretty much in the same the same camp on this one. It, it it's dull and it's inaccurate and yeah, it's just a movie, but it's not a good movie. That's yeah, the that's point. The problem. Yeah. And whether whether four hours, because what we've got is a cut down version of the intended product. It's not a director's cut, which is an entirely different beast. And uh, he's he's done director's cuts, which have added. Um, but could the four hour version possibly be any better? It's going to have the same inaccuracies, just more of them. Yeah. It's going I, to be I don't see that if you put more in more crap crass disregard for logic and yeah. reality that that doesn't improve a movie you just yeah. got more i don't know more people being charged up by horses yeah and then standing in line as they do at borodino there are um, bits i didn't care about the fact that yeah napoleon and wellington never met but the scene on the ship i could live with that that's the sort of Crossing the line. I mean, I there, there's something speak. nice in there, actually. If you wanted to kind of go into symbolism, they yeah. filmed it on HMS Victory. You've got kind of Nelson, Wellington, and Napoleon all in the same room. That you could play with yeah. some ideas. Yeah, there. I, 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 but it was just everything that had gone before. The previous, it was just the previous two hours and twenty five minutes that were the problem. Um, <laughs> I loved, I loved the way he just he just died in his chair. That that was that was very. Um, what did that remind him? It reminded me of I think it's Godfather Two, where Al Pacino as an old man just falls off just his chair, topple sideways. And that's exactly what he did. Um, but oh, I I wanted to like it so much. I didn't go there to hate this film which I, I'm sometimes guilty of doing. I did not do that. And I just didn't come out with much, obviously, much good to say about it. Um, no, I mean, there were, some, there were some nice little touches. And we, we, we can't talk about Ridley Scott without mentioning his Napoleonic masterpiece, The Duelists from 1970, um, which is a great example of small being beautiful. Um, yes. If you don't have a cast of thousands, do it with 12 people. Um, and... A great, great movie, and the the scene with the um, from the retreat from Moscow, which I I think it's filmed in Glencoe in Scotland. And uh, was I wrong in seeing the empty wagon at Austerlitz? In the, no, it was it, there was a scene from the retreat from Moscow, wasn't there? Of course there was. Was that an homage to his his own film, where we get the 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 scene with? Kaitel and Karadin meeting in the snow, fighting off the Cossacks. It looked like it looked like that set without them in it. And I thought, oh, is that a you know a tip of the hat to myself, perhaps Ridley? Um, but uh, I mean, I was still kind of reeling from the ninja Cossacks that we got that was <laughs> the, yeah, the with ninja. their mortars as well. <laughs> what would yeah those those mortars that appeared? They, they clearly like those because they're at too long. Yeah. And then, they're, then they're wheeled. Yeah, they're they're in the in the, the snowy wastes of Russia. Talking of too long, Luke Reynolds, um, friend of the show, um, made the point to me the other day. He wasn't expecting to see Darth Vader pitch up to breach the walls <laughs> at too long, which I thought was a fantastic line. Full credit to Luke for that. But if you look at the costumes, there is something very. It's either that or it's sort of the King's Guard in the final season of Game of Thrones, where they've ditched the white and they've gone all black. Yeah. Yeah, it's um no, it was um if I I thought there was there was that there was that BBC series. In fact, I got I got the because I've obviously been through all my old DVDs, the Tom Burke version, mm -hmm. um, the BBC multi-part thing, and I thought that was really good. And and the depiction of Toulon in that is far more realistic, obviously, than than the Ridley Scott version. And it, funnily enough, it still manages to be entertaining. Um, I find that. It's funny, the, you were saying about being invited back. The week after, I went to see um, another film in the cinema that was about um, a, a minor aristocrat fallen on hard times, trying to rise through society, doing so on the, the blood of young people forced to fight, um, an individual sort of corrupted by a desire of power. Um, and I came to a realisation in the midst of that movie that the new Hunger Games film is the depiction of Napoleon's life that we never saw coming, that we deserved. It's, it's frankly as historically accurate. 
<laughs> so is that the is that the description of Hunger Games, or is that the depiction? You, the, the yeah, that's it's fully. about the rise for for folks who aren't familiar with the Hunger Games um, series. It's about the the rise of the the dictator that's in the main series, Corradinus Snow, and he kind of starts out as this good guy, falling on hard times, and rises up, um, Superb, stabs right. people in the back, all the rest of it. It's, and it's a that. better film. You feel things in the course of that. The music is better. You've got better little nods to the the wider history of, of that universe. It's it's the Napoleon movie that we deserved, quite frankly. It'll be a uh, Zach, it will be a while before I'm tempted back to the cinema, I have to say. I've been I've been bruised. Um but so what happened was at, at that point I came out of the cinema and I thought I've held my tongue. I've been a I've been a gentleman. I've held my tongue until I've actually seen the bloody movie. And um, so you know I I took I took the uh, the selfie in front of the poster and and left with my tail between my legs. And the first I think the first tweet I put out um, or whatever the hell it's called this week um, was. Uh, Really wanted to like this movie. Um, worst depiction of Waterloo ever on screen. And of course it's Waterloo that I'm going to react to because it, it is it is a place that I am and an event that I like to think I'm reasonably familiar with. And so I thought I'd love to talk about this to somebody, but I, I don't just want to rant, which we've, we've probably was it that three hours we've just spent ranting oh, about. Oh, believe me, I've decided that we're going to cut that segment and do a dedicated video just on <laughs> Tony Pollard <laughs> destroys Ridley Scott's depiction of Waterloo. So not only is this going to be a long podcast and a long video cast, <sighs> we're going to have segments of this because that was just a thing of beauty. Oh, superb. Well, that's that's great. But but I thought I, I can't just go and froth at the mouth um about this because for a start every, every every person and their dog had done that um so i thought right let's be more constructive as i try to be and i i'm very keen one of my ambitions before i retire um is to put on a course dedicated to war and the moving image in which we will discuss not just film but making and i will get students to make their own documentaries on their, their phones and stuff and bring in TV friends and, you know, a, 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 I think a great course. And it seems to every, everyone I've talked to about it at the university seems quite positive about it. So we might do that. So I thought, well, if this was a teaching opportunity, let's, let's, let's unpack it like that and say, if Ridley Scott's film is a teaching opportunity, the low hanging fruit, obviously, is the massive amount of nonsense in it. Um, I thought slightly more constructive would be to see where it fits, particularly with Waterloo, in the history of the depiction of Waterloo in cinema, of which this is obviously the most recent. So I went away and did a bit of homework, um, and I've got a list of films here. So if I if I look off screen, it's not because I'm stargazing or, or looking at coffee being delivered. I, I'm trying to because this is all fairly fresh. So I, I, I mean, got... I'll be the first to admit that there are far more interesting things to do during a podcast than stare at my face. So well, you're very welcome to look where well, you need to. Because because I, I probably can't see this anyway, but but it's all fairly fresh to me. But I thought people would, and and you know, we clearly enjoy talking about this, would would appreciate some of this stuff. So I went through and, and, and spent some time when I should probably be marking student essays. Uh, we'll get back to them. Um, digging into the history of, of not just Napoleon on screen, but more specifically Waterloo on screen. And that first point, Napoleon on screen, there is one of, one of my sources here, an important one, has been a book called Napoleon, an Epic in 1000 Films. And it's by a French film historian called Hervé Dumont. And it came out, surprise, surprise, in 2015. For those that don't know, it was the 200th anniversary. It was a very busy year for all of us. And that's only available in French, and it's it's a big price tag, and I've got enough doorstopper books. But very generously, he seems to have deposited most of that text into a website, which is basically, well, it is, it's an encyclopedia of historic movies. And we can put the link in so people, could, and it's almost searchable. You've got themes of Napoleon. So there's the, his, 
there's a big section on Napoleon and it's it's that big basically I think because it's his book and you can you can tie it down to the hundred days and the decline that's where obviously where Waterloo is going to appear um, and well the first stunner is there are a thousand appearances of Napoleon on screen that's not Obviously, films about Napoleon, that's Bill and Ted, that's every cartoon he's been in. But nonetheless, that's that's quite a popular guy for someone so unpleasant. Um, but then I tried to tie down the Waterloo stuff, and there's there's you'll be relieved to know that there's a lot less. Apparently, though, there, there, was, there was another factoid. There were 180 films with Napoleon out before the First World War. This is what I was going to touch on. That they start early, don't they? They do. Properly they do. Early. They do. the the first the first uh, The first films are by the the Lumieres in Paris. Entre vue de Napoléon et du Pape, incontro tra Napoleone e il Papa, è filmato numero 750 del catalogo Lumière. Si tratta di un film di finzione diretto da Alexander Promio che rievoca l'episodio storico dello scontro tra l'imperatore Napoleone e il Papa Pio VII. They did that famous one with the moon and the, the rocket um, in its eye, and um, they. I think the first, the first of those is eighteen ninety seven, and there's little clips of. And what I've done is I, I've I've dug out what I can. Some of this stuff is on YouTube, and I'm I'm hoping that you as as a Ridley Scott type will be able to cut those into our discussion um yeah this is so for folks listening to the audio version you're going to want to head over to youtube i'm going to intersperse what i can um obviously mindful of the copyright challenges but this is fair use um because we're reviewing it so there will be yeah. segments um in the youtube um versions that go out so head over to the youtube channel as well i'll stick the link in the description for that so you've got um easy access to that as well Fabulous. So, so anyway, I, I did, I did, I did this ex excavation. So, so to 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 start on the list, um, the first one that actually features Waterloo is 1903. We've got a little movie called the Napoleonic Epic, which is put out by Pathé in Paris, and it's apparently their first historical cinema. And it's 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 not a war movie. Um, it's it's a series of tableaux, so it's that Trump Loy thing. That tr so that it, it's it's living characters within artily created sets that look like paintings, but they they kind of look like like real. And there's some basic movement. Now I'm I'm taking this from the description because I, I haven't been able to find any footage of it. I don't. Some of this stuff is entirely lost. I mean, and, and the, the history of cinema is full of lost classics. But apparently that there is a section in that part 13 of that, which I assume is kind of painting 13, um, is Waterloo Fall of an Eagle. So that is that is the first, as far as I know, cinematic depiction of Waterloo. We then go to 1909, it was a very busy year um, for Waterloo on, on the cinema screen. We've got incidents in the life of Napoleon and Josephine. So obviously the romantic driver is, is very early. This is one of the reasons this story lives on. It is, it is a love story. Um, and it's made by an animator, but it's, it's live action. It's got a guy called William Humphrey as Napoleon. And again, it's part of it. It seems to be the first part is basically about the tragedy of their, their love life and their relationship. And at one point, well, uh, Napoleon appears to Josephine as a ghost, which is kind of odd, given the mortality of the two. Um, but then it seems it, it switches to Napoleon in exile um, in front of his bed. Whenever he's in exile, he's near his bed because he's obviously got to crawl into that to die. Um, and he's he's having flashbacks to his greatest hits. So he goes through all the, a lot of his battles. We get our stullets and the, the, we get the retreat from Moscow. But then we do get we do get Waterloo. And again, it's it's just like a tableau.
there's a bunch of a bunch of uh, Imperial Guard, I think they're meant to be shooting in one direction with Napoleon waving his sword. And uh, he eventually leaves leaves screen and then the, obviously the Imperial Guard all die. And that's it. It's just momentary. But it, it, it counts. Um, if we want to get to kind of epic scale, to proper depictions as we would understand them, we have to go to 1913. And this is a real watershed. This is a film called The Battle of Waterloo. Imagination and it, in the title, right there. It does. I, 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 I kind of like the cut down version, Lou. Um, but, or Water with Michael Caine. No, we won't go there. It's an absolutely atrocious film. Um, but not unrelated. This is made by an outfit called the British and Colonial Film Company, which tells you a lot of where we're at in history. And it is regarded as the first real British history movie. You could almost call it epic. The Italians were doing stuff and others were doing stuff. And obviously Hollywood was on the go. But this is the first real big British effort. And it's filmed in Northamptonshire, um, outside a town um, where there happens to be a local barracks. So they use, I, I, I think I read the 12th Lancers are stationed there at the time, and they use them in the movie. Guys on horses that know what they're doing, always a good start. Um, it's directed by an American called Charles Weston, who was apparently an opium addict and died of an overdose, I think, in New York, not too many years after. So this is his magnum opus. Um, and it was shot in five days, and they used this location because apparently Wellington said it reminded him of Waterloo. So quite clearly, okay. it's a place I want to visit. I've poked around on Google Earth, can't see anything that, that satisfies. So I might have to put this place on my unexpected bucket list. <laughs> but anyway, so it, it's shot in five days for 1,300 quid, which that's a lot of money back then, I imagine. Mm. But five um, days to do yeah. it is, is not long. Five, five days. And... They used the soldiers, local people. Um, some were paid, some were just volunteers as extras. And apparently there were two shoe factories in this town that had to close down for the period of the shooting because all of the, all of their employees had buggered off to, to refight Waterloo, which is fabulous. Um, so, so it boasts, it boasts. Its tagline is 200... Oh, no, that, that last zero is quite small. 2,000 soldiers... 116 scenes, 1,000 horses, and 50 cannons. Now, I refuse to believe 50 cannons for a start. We can take it back from there. But having seen the clips, now the thing is that this thing was 75 minutes long originally. It was thought to be lost. But the British Film Institute found in an archive 22 minutes of it. And I think there's about two minutes of that actually on YouTube for us to view without having to go to an archive. And it gives a very good idea. without having to go to an archive. And it gives a very good idea of what this thing is like. Um, it's it's a bit like a reenactment. Um, Napole Napoleon looks looks like Napoleon and and looks very worried at times. And there's there's a lot of horses milling about. There's there's no real sense of uh, narrative in that certainly in the, the short clip that's on. One, one bit that I particularly liked was Napoleon has his back to the battle, looking towards the screen, looking very concerned. And there's a, there's a wrecked cannon behind him. 
and dead French soldiers. And one of them, one of them is kneeling by the cannon shooting. And, um, you know, they've all got big hats on. So you assume they're meant to be guards. And uh, you see him fiddling with it. And it's quite clear. Well, I think it's a Martini Henry that he's got because I think he's got a round stuck in the breech and he's fiddling about with it like this. So you you end up, it's really sketchy, but you end up freezing frame and stuff to try and, you do it a lot with this stuff. It's, it's, it's a rabbit hole. But it, it may, it was really popular. And there are loads of photos of big posters of this thing outside these early cinemas. And it, it, it made um, 5,000 pounds just on distribution fees. Um, so that's that's even before kind of footfall and ticketing. So it, it did it did very well. Now, as an aside, um, that company, um, what they called the British and Colonial Film Company, some of their staff were later involved during the First World War. Obviously, we're at the eve of the First World War here. In 1916, they shot that very famous film, The Battle of the Somme, um, actually on the front while the battle is happening, um, which gets a release in August of 1916. I mean, the battle goes on till November, but yeah. it's, it's in British cinemas. And do you know how many people saw that in Britain in the first six weeks? I wouldn't even want to guess. I'd imagine the number's sort of as high as it can be, given that there's a war on. 20 million people is the figure. And that, that's cited in various locations. Now, that might be Dr. Wikipedia playing, but I think I did hear, because we we gave a showing of it at the university when we were marking the, the 100th anniversary of the, the Great War, uh, the First World War, and Glasgow University's involvement. And we showed the film, and I'm pretty sure, we, even today, it's the biggest box office ever. Obviously, there were not other distractions other than a major war just across the, the channel. Um, but 20 million in, in six weeks, that's just in UK audiences. So a cinema was clearly working and war on screen was clearly working. So it's no wonder that we get maybe a thousand movies of feature, or, well, not quite movies, but a thousand appearances of, of Napoleon. So the Battle of Waterloo 1913 is, is interesting and important. We then get to probably the big elephant in the room, which is 1927, is Napoleon by Abel Dance, the classic. Yeah. And that's been released by the, the BFI, and it's, what is it, six and a half hours or thereabouts? Um, oh, part one. <laughs> and, of, and that's, what was meant to be something like six, right? It was six, and, and we don't have to worry ourselves with it because it gets nowhere near Waterloo. It, he, as you say, he was intending six parts, um, that never happened. Uh, he, funding issues, obviously, and I think he probably gave himself PTSD trying to do that. I think he realised that this was this was not. Uh, and this is why Ridley Scott, you, you have to have a thick skin to be able to do this stuff, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, But he did in 1960 make a movie called Austerlitz. How does and, that stack up? Um, it's interesting. Is it Austerlitz or Austerlitz? How do we pronounce it? Well, Austerlitz. if you're going for the, the Germanic... Um, pronunciation yeah. Austerlitz. That's good. That's good. Pretend I didn't quiz that. I knew exactly what I was talking about there. And I don't pretend to be a, a, an expert in Austerlitz. But um, it, it's interesting and it does have the ice. And it, it's done quite well. Um, there are, there are, and it's quite shocking actually. It, it, it's clearly in a studio, but there are, there are, uh, gun carriages with horses going under the going into the ice. They don't seem to fall far, but it's it's quite effectively done. And of course, this is this is one of the things that uh, Ridley Scott's film got panned for because was it a single soldier or something fell in fell into the the frozen lake? I think they found two bodies when two bodies. Napoleon had the lake strained, and then of course he yeah. inflates the numbers and makes it something like two thousand. Yeah. Well, let um, me tell you this: I've spent I spent ten years digging Waterloo, and we found one body so but we know we know there's reasons for that mm -hmm. um so there's there's that classic which we can all we can all we should all go and, and sit and watch but it, it doesn't it doesn't really bother us here because waterloo is not in it so we then come back to let me check my other screen yeah i i think we then come back to a very interesting period is Let's, this the nazi napoleon thing we've got we've got well Depending, we've got one before that, 
Um, that's 1935. We get Nazi Napoleon. That's worth waiting for. Okay. We'll do. We'll go back to Britain first. Well, there's a little teaser for you, folks. Yes, we've got, we've got a Nazi Napoleon coming. But before we get there, we've got we've got again in filmed filmed in 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 the UK. We've got the Iron Duke. Oh yes, which is the Wellington biopic that we've all wanted, and this this um, stars George Arliss. I think it was one of his first speaking roles, um, kind of silent star. And you can tell he's he's fairly advanced in years when he's playing Wellington in this movie. And to cut a long story short, it, it starts out with them all dis- realising that, that the ogre had been released and all of this stuff. And so we get the build up to the battle. And the battle takes up relatively little time in the film as per, but there's still about 20 minutes after the battle most of which is taken up with Wellington trying to stay the execution of Ney. Um, so there's a, there's a breakneck speed carriage ride as he, as he arrives in France to get to the, the where he's going to be executed. And uh, he's minutes late. Of course he is. So, so Ney's already gone shoot, shoot at the heart and he's, he's yeah, laid yeah. out there just as Wellington gets out of the carriage. I mean, absolutely. And, and there's been a big, a big um, scandal has been orchestrated to try and keep him away from France to stop him from doing this. So this, is the, this, is, this isn't even the subplot. Waterloo is a subplot to this, but hokum. Um, but probably more realistic than Ridley Scott's anyway. But the battle, the battle um, is interesting. Um, it it involves a, a confusion which is common to quite a few of these films, which is what happens at Ligny and Quatre Bois. Uh, basically, they either get a mention or they don't, or they don't happen, or Wellington isn't involved. Now, in this, we start. There's a there's a, a credit comes up, and it says uh, the eve of Waterloo, and Wellington's in a in a in a, um, a house. Um, clearly a peasant cottage, uh, reading a letter from Blucher, and he's trying to make out the right. He says, "Always oh, right, so 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 lightly on the paper or whatever." And it, it's basically Napoleon saying he's been beaten by Napoleon as it, and is in retreat. And Wellington says something like, "I told him not to get bogged down at Cotterabois. He'll have to join us later." And so, Wellington, come on, somebody needed to pick up a book. I, I know it's it's what the Wellington's 1930s, at Waterloo, but... and and it and it's the Prussians that are doing all of this fighting two days previously, further south. So it's all very confusing. But it is not the only film that that has difficulty. I, I think I think producers and writers have have decided that three battles within two or three days is is too confusing for the viewer and even more than that if we throw in love and what else, whatever else so we'll just have waterloo and a bit of stuff happening around that we can just name drop on um so we then get to we then get to the the battle and we actually see um a fairly good french cavalry charge and, and wellington himself orders his infantry to prepare to receive cavalry and they actually go from line into square but hmm. because of the the camera angles and the the primitive shooting style, you can't really see what they're doing. You know, they don't have a helicopter or a drone to show you it in formation and, and, and forming up. Um, but uh, Bundachok's film gets a lot of praise, and I really like it um, for recreating the uh, Scots Greys charge. Yeah. Call them that. Um, and the 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 uh, Lady Butler painting, he recreates that. It wasn't the first to do it. It's in this film, and it's done pretty well. These are these are obviously heavy guys used to horses at speed, and it's it's that it's that scene. But it goes a step further because we've all heard the story about the Highlanders holding onto the stirrups of the Scots Greys, and they're doing that. They do that in this film. You know, this this is not CGI. These are guys running alongside the horses, holding onto the stirrups. Um, so it's it's that's pretty spectacular. Um, we've got some of the common tropes in it. I, I've already mentioned that the the artillery generals don't kill yeah. generals in cold blood. Um, Napoleon, not a gentleman. Um, the new trope that Ridley Scott has has given us, which is trenches on the battlefield. There's a possible trench in this movie. It's not new. 
Who and knew? Maybe this is where he got it all from. Well, maybe maybe this is his source material. <laughs> um, basically, this this is not an accurate depiction of the battle because it's so truncated. But basically, what we get is the British cavalry um, uh, charges down the hill, and the French are in a trench. Um, there's a front rank of musketeers kneeling down in what is clearly a linear negative feature, to use an archaeological parlance, which looks to me a hell of a lot like a trench. And behind it, there's upcast with a second rank of French soldiers kneeling behind that, firing over the heads of the guys in the trench. And quite spectacularly, the, the cavalry leap over it. Now, again, you mentioned this possibility. Is that meant to be? Because in a later... Quite soon after, you see there are some bushes on, on some of the upcast. Is it meant to be a ditch at the edge of a field where, the, where there's a hedge? Because as we know, the, the, the agricultural architecture out there, if you like, you've got hedges and ditches. Um, but it looks a hell of a lot like a dug trench, dug for the purpose of defending troops. Um, so Ridley Scott is potentially not the first. This came as a big surprise. Um, I'm not sure whether the Iron Duke is on YouTube. Hopefully it is. And if it is, I, I, I suspect it's on it in its entirety. Um, so people can check that out for themselves. Um, I can certainly provide um, from my DVD, um, provide uh, stills from that as evidence. But that's great. But there's lots of there's lots of marching soldiers. And this is this is the thing about the the earlier films that that and and well, some of the later ones, you can't make out what's happening. It's just a lot of men milling about. Which brings us to Nazi Napoleon. Okay. Now this is we're a good looking. One. I'm just going to let this, you <coughs> let you go. This is this is on. fairly stunning. This is from 1935, but it's sometimes shown as 1934. But say 1934, 35. So about the same time that the Iron Duke is released in the UK, and it's called Campo de Maggio. Um, otherwise known as the Hundred Days, though so that that refers not to the Hundred Days. That's something else entirely. We don't have time to go into that. Um, and it's it's directed by a chap called Rosano, but the mastermind behind this film is one Benito Mussolini, um, fascist leader of Italy, who obviously sees himself in Napoleon. Uh, this is Napoleon complex on screen. So he first uh, co-writes, or so it appears, a play about Napoleon. And it's quite popular. It's, it's performed in Rome, in Vienna, in Paris. It's turned, into, it's turned into a film with essentially Mussolini at the helm, though he's not directing it per se. But it's produced by his younger son, Vittorio. And the funding, funnily enough, is a co-Italian German production. You can see where this is going. And so it's filmed, at least in part, on the plain of Tuscany. Um, so plenty of open ground. You can do, obviously, you can transpose a battlefield to anywhere as long as you've got room to manoeuvre horses. Um, and it, the, the amazing thing is that, that Mussolini was on set ordering people about, um, which is absolutely outrageous but it gets it gets it gets better or worse um this it gets a bit muddied here but basically there is a german version so it's shot you know like, like the early the bella lugosi dracula they they film a, a a british version or an english version and a spanish version at the same time so there's a german version being i've seen reference to that being filmed in france but i i, I don't it, it seems to be, and certainly I think Dumont in his book talks about it on the same sets and the same uh, chunks of landscape. But to cut a long story short, there is there is a German version of the film with an entirely different cast, different director, and a different take on it slightly. Um, so Napoleon in this, um, I, I've totally skirted over the, the Italian act, but I'm, I'm very keen to get to the German Napoleon is a chap called Werner Krauss. Now, he's a very well-known German actor. He'd already played Napoleon in 1929 in a little thing called Napoleon on St. Helena. 
Uh, but he's in a more famous film called The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. So he's there, you know, the famous school of German expressionism. And he is a Nazi. And we're uh, talking properly. Proper anti-Semitic. in the world. Absolutely. Appear, appears in at least one very, very nasty anti-Semitic um, Nazi party funded propaganda film. Um after the war, he is denazified. Um, he is he goes through an enforced period of denazification and is basically put put aside. He has a slight comeback later in his life, but I think he 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 dies probably quite deservedly in you know obscurity. Um, but it seems a fairly nasty piece of work to me. Um, but anyway, he he does this, and he you know he has the, the that later period Napoleon look, um, heavy set. Um, and there, there is. I had problem tracking this down. There is there is a extended clip on YouTube of I think is it twenty minutes or so? I can't remember how long it is. Um, from a film archive, and it's just described as Napoleon and and Wellington at Waterloo. But I was looking at this and thinking, this is this film. But I, I needed to be sure because I couldn't work out whether it was the Italian version. The problem is there's no sound. The film, I think, was sound. There's no sound on this. And it, it, it looks it looks fairly, fairly primitive. But I, I worked out uh, it's definitely the same actor. It's the German. It's an extract of the German version. So it is the Nazi Napoleon. And um, so he's, he's apparently in this a bit more ponderous. And and they also focus on uh, the Prussians. Obviously, the, there's a lot of sympathy for Blucher. So they're sympathetic both to Napoleon because he gets screwed around by, you know, minions, um, which dictators shouldn't shouldn't have to go through. Plus, there's the Germans, the you know, proto proto German state getting involved. This this German version of of Hundred Days is is interesting and in that it tries to give us some idea of what happened in the battle. So we get Napoleon... And it's worth just saying that up until this point, as you kind of alluded to earlier, it's just there are some movements, um, a few kind of little almost cliched images, if you like. Um, But but this is a a proper, more detailed telling of of what developed. Yeah, yeah. To to go back to, I meant to mention the Iron Duke, the one we discussed previously, the, the, the battle ends there. Uh, when when the the British cavalry jump the, the French trench, the Prussians arrive at the same time, and that's basically it. That's the end of the battle, which is as as far as timelines go, is fairly confusing as far as you know for us. But anyway, this this does try to give some idea of what happened. So we see Napoleon, a map. He's drawing a map. He draws on the roads. He draws on the farms, and it, um, it draws in what looks like Durlons, um infantry attack and so we get some context and then of course we we switch to the battle itself and it it, it, there are a lot of people involved it looks fairly impressive cast of thousands there's there's a lot again lots of marching lots of lots of close quarter melee which i kind of hate because you can't it's just guys clubbing one another with musket butts um um but there are there are interesting bits. There are um, the 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 cavalry charge. Nay, in this is clearly absolutely nuts. He's bonkers. He's lost it um, quite spectacularly. I, I wish the sound was working. Uh, the French cavalry charge is is pretty good. And interestingly, there is mud, so you actually see the squares and the the French cavalry. That 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 seems fairly impressive. The close work with the camera. Uh, British soldiers or uh, Wellington's men. Um, we, we should we should mention that Brits only made up a third of Wellington's army and all of that stuff. Um, yes, but you know, how do we a, know? Because we weren't there. Under we the weren't there. That's true. Well, what am I? What am I providing caveats for? Read your own Wikipedia. Um, and and that's 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 quite good. And it also has that trope that appears quite regularly from from quite early on which is the the uh, imperial guard dying in square and we actually get the utterance you can i'm, I'm no great lip reader but i'm i'm pretty sure that guy is is screaming mad 
Um, and that, you know, that's supposedly General Cambrone and they the die in square at the end. And he, he, he says something like the guard doesn't surrender. The guard dies. It doesn't surrender. And or merd. Yeah. And um, um, the, I think actually the the sources are probably lean more towards he just went merd when when asked to surrender, you know, yeah. oh, bollocks, you know, it's, this, this isn't how I wanted my day to go. But how much of, how much of that is all down to Victor Hugo, you know, and all of that stuff? Because well, exactly. I I had I had read that he was actually captured by Halkett. Mm. Um, so anyway, it it it's it's one of it's one of those bits that historians always pick holes in, um, especially when it comes to Bundachuk. But um he's he, he this was well embedded in the the cinematography of uh, um Waterloo prior to prior to 1970 and is so that a reflection sorry to jump in there is, is that a reflection of the medium you know you need some inverted commas iconic images and this is one that's it's very visceral yeah to hell with reality or otherwise if you've got the guard dying in square napoleon's elite hey it's a moment that you can hang your hat on is yeah, that why it, it gets repeated I, I think so it's it's a full stop but it also leaves the the, the french with honor um it's not it's not the the guard fleeing fleeing to paris is it it's it's kind of it's it, it's timeless so it 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 gets picked up and i don't remember ridley scott doing it though did he and i could have blanked it out of my memory no but it might have been cut out um, oh four hours the four, four hour hours. version there we um, go no it ends with napoleon sort of raising his sword in salute to wellington as if napoleon <sighs> somehow rated wellington and the marshal's <laughs> breakfast thing never happened oh uh, you know. yes well he was no gentleman as we've as we've heard from uh george arliss um so that 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 is um and, and apparently um the, the the german version at least was banned by the allies in 1945 though again i I'd, I'd want to see more evidence of this i i've scratched the surface on a lot of this stuff and i'm now kind of addicted to to finding out more but that that co-production the the idea and apparently there were there were a swastika flags on set when when they were filming the and the, the, one of the closing scenes as far as i can see is um the prussians actually kneeling in prayer on their victory um and napoleon uh shakes the hand of a fallen french soldier and then walks off with his iconic back and hat to us uh into the into the gun smoke and and that seems that well that's all that's available on on youtube so quite fascinating but in 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 many many respects very unpleasant so Ridley Scott, come back, all is forgiven, maybe. So that takes us up to um, well, we've got we've got we've kind of got some stuff going on in a, but there's a, a a quick one here which has an an interesting contextual detail. We've got a French version of Napoleon a movie which tells his life story from 1955. Um, uh, directed by Sasha Gultry, who also appears, I think, as Talleyrand in it. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think he's in it. Um, who's telling the story? And uh, it's it's filmed in various places, bits in Normandy. The battle scenes appear to be the south of France. Uh, there was filming around Nice, um, and again, the big battles appear. So we've got Austerlitz, we've got Waterloo, but they all look the same. They're all the same landscape. I, I've actually seen. Um, claims that the battle in this film was filmed at Waterloo. Um, it clearly was not. It's a sunny southern European limestone outcroppy type place. Um, but again, wide open landscapes with hills in the background. It's it's great for a battle. And I I think I think basically they 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 filmed a load of battle scenes and spliced them together to make whatever they need. Um, stick a Union Jack in or a Union flag in where required. Um, and it's. It's got a lot of narration, okay. a lot of the English version certainly has. And I, I, this this again, this is the entire film in 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 uh, the English version. Um, the English dubbed version is on YouTube. It's got a lot of narration giving you the historical context. Of, and so the battles are very, very, very brief. They're almost back to those tableaus. Um, and the war begins again. They come from everywhere. Austria, Berlin, Moscow, England.
19th. From daybreak alone, he faces the whole of Europe and engages the Battle of Waterloo. hand-to-hand fights, charges, furious skirmishes, all fused to turn the pain into an inferno. and returns to the attack six times. Every yard won is almost a victory. The eagle was waiting for Grouchy. He arrives. It's he. No, it's the Prussians led by Blücher. might say, hope changed camps, and the tide of battle was reversed. Bring forward the guard! guard, whose charge always held in victory, entered the inferno to die immortal. Back to those tableaus. Um, and this was 1955, so there wasn't, there wasn't a great hunger for glorifying warfare then, given that the French had been kicked out of Indochina and lost all of their colonies, Tihi, mm-hmm. um, Dien Bien Phu the year before, um, modern France's Waterloo, if you like. Um, but there is, there is a link there. So it's got... It's got Lots of cavalry chasing about. You can't tell what the hell happens in the battle. Um, there are red coats delivering fire, volleys against against cavalry, and you know infantry advancing. It's all gives no real idea. But um, it, it's written that the red coats were imported from the UK, and they were worn by a unit of French paratroopers recently returned from Indochina, Vietnam to you and I. Um, so there is a there is a, a shade there of, of mm. contemporary French conflict and the death of their empire, their mo- their most recent empire, which which kind of appeals. Um, but uh, again, again, the guards the guards die there, and the, the narrator says the the uh, the imperial guard entered the inferno to die immortal. It's um, it's all very okay. overdramatic. Yes. Um, but when it comes to the narration, and we come to uh, the great unmade film, uh, Kubrick, uh, that's, you read the screenplay of that, it's very narration. There's a lot of detail, which is, is voiceover. Interesting. Um, 
which which he he later uses when he gets to the mid seventies and makes Barry Lyndon. Um, there's a there's a lot of which I'm very fond of, and I, I really. And did you not? Barry Lyndon's very famous for its uh, natural light and NASA lenses and all of that stuff. And I I kind of thought that um, uh, Ridley Scott was trying to emulate some of that or homage to it with the interior scenes. Well, uh, Sam I'm... Jolly made the point during the um, the review episode that we did, uh, in fact, it was the last episode, that in places it sort of looks as though the entire thing's viewed through the gaze of somebody who perhaps is suffering from cataracts. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think at one point I described it as Barry Lyndon with all of whatever genius it was that Barry Lyndon had sucked from it. It just really, really quite poor. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm digressing. I can't even remember where I was, but so yes. Bondage, uh, sorry, not Bondage, Kubrick. Um, because, th- I mean, this is the one that everyone's now desperately praying is going to save, you know, yeah. kind of Napoleonic history and engagement for the modern age because Spielberg's picked it up, right? Exactly. So Spielberg, Spielberg's had it for years, um, but we can't talk about Kubrick without the biggie, which is obviously Wunderchuk's 19 cent. Now, I, I don't want to go into too much depth on this because we'll be here forever, but mm-hmm. um, I, I, I really, as a kid, you know, grew up on it, it and probably Zulu. Um it gets panned by some historians. Yes, it's not perfect. But when you look at the effort that went into making it, they scarped hills mm. to create the landscape. It always bugged me that there were mountains in the background. Um, I only, only you know, relatively recently learned that they were the Carpathians in 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 Ukraine. So, and Bondarchuk was a, a a Ukrainian director, but we're we're very much embedded. 1970 in the, the Soviet era. Now, the th- the thing is that this this the the prehistory of of this movie uh, released in 1970 is really interesting, and I again only recently learned this. So basically, that the power, the driving force behind this is not Bundachuk; it's the Italian producer Dino De Laurentiis. And he has this idea of a a, a Waterloo movie. Um, but then he learns that an American producer called Sam Marks is running with the idea. And as it develops, uh, a film, again, surprisingly called The Battle of Waterloo. Um, and he has, and talking about great films that weren't made, he has Richard Burton in the frame to play surprisingly Wellington um so what happens is that De Laurentiis go gets into partnership with Marx and they they kind of rework this and they bring on board uh John Houston you know genius the man that should have made the man who would be king and did eventually make the man who would be king but with the cast that you know, wasn't his first choice. No, so there's no, absolutely. He's, he's the long history of development in movies. Um, so they have lined up Richard Burton to play Napoleon. Better. You can see. And the killer, Wellington, played by Peter O'Toole. Oh. Now, what a powerhouse that would have been. Just absolutely, you know, Beckett. They were both hammered, but turned in tour de forces. Um, imagine, imagine that. The problem was that they couldn't get the funding. Um, they had all the horses. The horses were nicked by Tony Richardson, who made a little thing around the same time called the Charge of the Light Brigade. So mm-hmm. all the empty horses went off to, to Tony Richardson and they couldn't get money for it. But De Laurentiis eventually got money from Mosfilm, basically the official production company in Moscow, Soviet production company, which brought with it the Red Army. And hence, we get 15,000 or whatever it is, extras in that movie. And the rest, as they say, is history. It's not perfect. Um, One of the things I've heard a, 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 a historian known to both of us recently complain about is the fact that you don't see round shot. It's not solid shot. It's all exploding shells. Um, well, let's just say... Well,
shells. Um, well, let's just say, well, they did exist at the time. I, I, we found elements of, of how it's a shells at, at Waterloo. But yeah, they don't show round shot. And none of these films do because they, they look quite dull on screen, mm -hmm. given the, well, it's odd given the chaos they cause. Um, and they're hard to replicate. So every one of these films, when an artillery round lands, there will be a puff of smoke or an explosion. This is the um, point about artistic license, right? And yes, you can't exactly. Be, you can't create a 100% historically accurate no. representation. Partly so because actually you can't fire round shot at people, funnily enough. There are a few laws yeah. in the way of that. I can't think of, I, I, I meant to check it. I think, uh, dreadful film that it is, I think there might be um, a reasonably good depiction of round shot in Mel Gibson's The Patriot, okay. um, where I think you, you can quite clearly see this subsonic missile heading to, and I think it takes off somebody's leg or something. I might be imagining that, you know, there's a story of somebody putting out their, their foot to stop one of these cannibals and taking the leg yeah. clean off. Um, but that's that's the sort of forgivable stuff and there's there's obviously lots of other problems with it but it's it's the first and really the only film that gives you an idea of what happened in the battle um yes the the prussians arrived from the wrong direction and um as as i think they do in ridley scott's movie if i remember rightly or is that false memory? they absolutely do they arrive um, left. on the wrong side of the valley but you know in the grand yeah. scheme of things by that point you're just so yeah he's so inured to to just oh, um, oh! I should I, I should I should have mentioned that talking of the Prussians arriving in that scene, Napoleon um, on the map, Plancenoit actually appears and he points to it and he's it, I I think he's saying right send the young guard in, which is mm -hmm. the only time I think that complexity is arrived at in the in the telling of of the story, but um, but anyway that. There is, there is, there is no doubting the iconic status of Waterloo. We could do an entire program on that film, um, but it, it's. I'm, I'm, I'm very fond of it. I, I think I've, I've heard you described it as a, as an, as an entry level drug. Yes, um, it's a gateway drug. It's, it's a gateway exactly drug. That's, that's and, and this is what we, we wanted out of Napoleon, and, and that's yeah. the, the beef. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah, it is. I know. Yes, you. It's. This is the thing, isn't it? That it's sort of an open goal to take apart historical inaccuracies in films. But yes. in terms of engagement, yeah. um, Waterloo is good. Um, yeah. And yes, you can bemoan the, the lack of Prussians. There was more in the extended version um, that then subsequently got yeah. cut. Very unfortunate. But there's enough there. And the good lines are in there. As well. Yeah, the, di the dialogue, um, the dialogue sparks, and th there is now that brilliant big book on the making of, of Waterloo, which which I have, you know, I, I have dipped in quite regularly. So, so some great, great stories, and the iconic scene with the cavalry in the squares is is unbelievable. Um, yes, they sloughed up that hill in mud, but nonetheless, that that scene is 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 stunning, um, and all the more so when you consider that, that is now over 50 years old. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's- Are you with me? Yes, sir!
yeah, exactly. And that's that's another. I I, I would I would love to go return to Ukraine, and um, it would be one of the places I'd want. I, I found the location on. Google Earth, but you can't tell, you know, oh, there's the bit that they sculpted with bulldozers to create the two the two slopes. And yes, you know, there are problems. The slopes are incredibly steep. And but we have problems with the topography of Waterloo now. It's been smoothed out over time. It's not as severe as it was. And of course, there's that damned thing that ruined Wellington's battlefield in the form of the monument to the um, the Prince of Orange, who we're going to get to presently, I think. So I, I don't want to I don't want to to spend too much time on Waterloo because We've all seen it. We all, we all have our own feelings about it, but it, 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 it towers above everything else that we've been talking about. I, I think there are some incredible scenes in the early films, but they, they, those battle scenes generally just appear as a five or six minutes max in a longer film about Napoleon. Um, here we're looking at a film, a battle film, which is a very unusual beast. Um, so, so that brings us into Kubrick's film, which is famously the film that was never made. Now, Kubrick started working on a script for Waterloo in around, I think, 1967. The screenplay is dated September of 1969. Now, Kubrick being Kubrick took his research, and this is where we, we kind of clash with Ridley Scott, his research very seriously. And famously, there is a massive archive, which I, I almost once got into, and I've still not given up on that, getting in to see, um, of the, the absolute wealth of material that he had an army of researchers working on. And for us, in Joe and Joanna Public, um, kind of what we've got, which was a lovely Christmas present some years back from Maria, my wife, is a book dedicated to that archive. And it's it's just got the photographs, the costumes, um, kind of mood boards, notes, um, absolutely ex just tons of stuff. And this is all now, I think, in, in porter cabins on the, uh, the Kubrick estate. Um, but it also has the script. And so this, this is the film that everybody was kind of hoping for. Um, though I'm not sure how many people have read it. Um, it's interesting. Um, and I, I think Kubrick would undoubtedly make it his own. There's lots of animation in it. Um, th th this very certainly tries to give you an idea of what's happening. There's a lot of narration, big chunks of narration giving you the history, um, switch to animated maps, switch to the action, um, a very complex thing to put together. And of course, this is just the screenplay. Kubrick would do his own thing with it, I'm sure, when he got, it, got, to, got to production. But um, I can, it, for all of that research, when you, when you look at the screenplay, there are some issues with it. Um, that, and this, this might give you a flavor of the, 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 the battle, battle of Waterloo takes up um, one, two, three, four, about six pages of script. Um, with a long preamble of how they got there to the sure. to, and um, I'm sure this goes into detail about Quatrebra and Ligny and stuff. But but on page 180, we've got 207, scene 207, exterior British squares day. An incredible stalemate has developed in the battle. Dead men and horses are everywhere, and the British infantry in their defensive squares hold their fire and merely exchange stares with the hundreds of French heavy cavalry who prowl around them at a distance of no more than 20 yards. Then we get voiceover. So narrator comes in and says, after two hours of savage fighting, the British infantry had learned that when the French cavalry were close, the artillery stopped. And they also realized that each time they fired a volley, the cavalry would try and break through them before they could reload. So they stopped firing. Now, that's all kind of confusing. Um, I'm assuming he means Wellington's artillery, um, scared of hitting their own their own men in square. But kind of our understanding of how the squares worked and and, and the French cavalry, there's there's some quite odd stuff going on there. But I'm sure it would look great on screen, and I, I'm happy to live with it. Um, and then, oh, I like this bit. I really like this bit. A French colonel rides too close to one of the German squares. 
His horse stumbles and he falls, dazed. Two Brunswick soldiers dash out, take his purse, his watch and his pistols, and then blow his brains out. A cry of shame goes up from the nearby British square. <laughs> so they all manage to be pejorative towards their allies or their enemies or whatever. It's just, you know, Ridley Scott and the Mamelukes and the, the, the Brits and the Germans. Just I say, oh boy, that's not very sporting. We can't just, have any of that sort of thing. But given given the archaeology and the academic work I've done, I also like the idea that they're looting stuff in the midst of the battle, which they did. Um, and then it goes uh, 208, exterior French Ridge, day. Napoleon giving orders, nay covered with mud and bloodstains, has become a wild looking creature. So, yeah, straight out of, you know, Klaus Kinski does an A. Um, narrator, by 6 p.m., Napoleon had entered into the battle himself and was forced to commit 14,000 men of his general reserve to hold up Bulow's Prussians. So they're off to Plants and Wild, we presume. Um, and uh, and then we've got 209. I'll, I'll finish on this. Exterior battlefield day. The Imperial Guard infantry begin being blasted by a wall of British fire. They falter and retreat. Merde. The sound of musket balls against the French breastplates sounds like a hailstorm beating on windows. Now, Imperial Guard, Young Guard, Old Guard, I don't care, Mill Guard. They're not wearing breastplates, are they? They're really not. That's the Karassi. Confused there. Yeah, there's a bit of confusion. And now you know, it's just, a, it's just, it, 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 it's, it, it would be a dynamic document and would hopefully be reworked. But quite clearly, Kubrick is not going to be the answer to our Waterloo and Napoleon problem. Um, but with some work, might be. Now, uh, the news is, I think, that Kubrick has. Um, Spielberg has got hold of Kubrick's screenplay and is, but the point is that it's going to be so reworked and, and hopefully improved on um, that it's probably going to be unrecognizable anyway. But yeah, I'd imagine it's be, very much sort of Spielberg does. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it'd be nice to have Kubrick's name attached to it. Now they got they got to casting. Um, first choice was British actor David Hemmings who played Nolan in Tony Richardson's Charge of Light Brigade. Um, very well, I thought. Very good British actor in his youth. Um, but he was replaced, and I, I, I think he was actually contracted. Um, the second, second star was Jack Nicholson. Now, Jack Nicholson had a bit of form playing a French soldier, Napoleonic soldier. There's a, there's a I, I think it's a Corman movie, a Roger Corman movie called The Terror, um, where... Um, I can't remember whether it's based on Edgar Allan Poe. Most of them are where a French deserter arrives at a castle and all sorts of weird stuff happens. It's really dull. Uh, but, you know, he we have seen Jack Nicholson in a, in some sort of French Napoleonic uniform before then. So so we're, we're coming very much up to date now. So So unfortunately, due to a number of issues, including the really bad box office, that Bundy, and again, looking at the wider context, the real world, we're going through peak Vietnam at this time. Who the hell gives a damn about the romance of blue and red coats on a battlefield somewhere? Um, so it does terrible box office. Um, and uh, because of that, Kubrick can't get funding for, for his masterwork. So it, it, it disappears into the mists of, of film legend and porter cabins on his estate um and then i would just say sorry to yeah, again no please in there because people might sort of be thinking well now that everybody's gone and hammered um because i warned against this you know let's let's try and be positive about yeah what comes out from ridley scott because we want the the spielberg version to um be made but actually speaking to people within the industry it seems that there is a shift that has happened where streaming services are just hurling money at big costume production oh, so actually you know there, there is still a chance for the Kubrick Spielberg thing to to happen well, that'd be um, great that would be great because you know the, the air war thing that's coming out is all very well and good but it's not you know it's not my it's not my bag man but we, we can't finish there because we then have we have a uh, certain rifleman to talk about don't a certain we? rifleman who were on pain of death it's it's not going to strap a telescope to his um his rifle and if you did it would be call you a bastard yeah several times and go like that um we're of course talking about sharp with sean bean and i 
again, talking about gateway drugs, I suppose I was I was young when the, this stuff first came out. Um, TV series, uh, electric guitar soundtrack. Oh yes, made Napoleonic Warfare cool, and now I I enjoyed it at the time, um, and I think it did a great job, but it had an issue with numbers. South Essex will advance. And like... Right shoulders forward. March. We've got a flag, lads. You see me? I'm your colour. Me. Up, up. with numbers and like Ridley Scott's The Duelists when it kept things small which it usually tried to it was it was good you know my favorite episode of Sharp is when they go home and we have a kind of mini Peter Lou mm -hmm. that that works really well that episode where they come back from the Napoleonic Wars and end up fighting their own their own people in, you know, these industrial um, strifes, um, which is, I, I think, quite powerful. Um, but they did Waterloo, didn't they? They had to do Waterloo. And what what can you say? Well, on the positive side, it does try and give us a little bit of a, I suppose it's open university light education in Napoleonic tactics, isn't it, right? How many times are we told that you don't, you don't keep a line when there are cavalry about. You you form form square. Square. <laughs> and it, it's OK, fair enough. And it tries to give a kind of timeline. So we get Cotra Bran mm -hmm. and then we get then we get. Oh, it's it's uh, La Haison, isn't it? The, the farm that they're in. But it's major fault or one of its major faults isn't just the small numbers and the fact that you can't possibly. Sharp says, look. French lancers, thousands of them, and there's six guys lurking in the woods on ponies. Um, you can't do that without CGI in those numbers, but obviously we prefer not to have to do CGI in our, uh, our fairy tale Waterloo movie. The real problem here, I think, is, is the way that Bernard Cornwall perceives the history. Yes. And we get this very old-fashioned idea of Dutch-Belgian troops being cowards. And they literally run away at Quatre Bras and the Prince of Orange ends up chasing after them. Come back, you cowards. And, you know, the real story of Quatre Bras, it was, am, I, am, I, am I wrong in thinking that they, they put up a fairly good show there? Part of their problem is that they put up such a good show that they're absolutely hammered um, to the point when Derlon goes in, they're, they've yeah. got nothing left. They've They've... <laughs> lost me like a third of their numbers by the time they actually get to Waterloo you know you don't do that just by running away at the first sound of gunfire but side rant yeah exa ex exactly and and it goes on throughout the theme the theme throughout is that and yes some bad decisions were made but it, it becomes really tiresome and it becomes at the am I am I remembering remembering it right that Sharp actually shoots him at the end Oh yeah, well certainly in the book. Um, I think I'm pretty I think, sure it's in the. I think um, he does, um, and because because obviously the, the 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 prince was um, was wounded in the battle. That's mm -hmm. that's the reason his mum and dad build that big uh, big mound. <laughs> but uh, it again looking at commonalities between these films, there are explosions and smoke going off left, right, and centre. You can't damn well move without the. They've, they've obviously had a lot of black powder that they needed to use. 
And uh, so these ground planted uh, squibs are going off left, right and centre to show the impact of cannon shot. Um, so it's it's not my favourite. Um, and clearly it, it, it was some sort of an end for Sharp because major characters are killed off in it. Harris goes and um, and whoever. But um, I can TV do Waterloo? Well, this is the interesting one with Vanity Fair, isn't it? Which is the next obvious point of comparison because, and there's a direct line actually from Vanity Fair to the Ridley Scott depiction because yeah. I believe the same, well, at least one of the people who was in charge of the the troop training for Vanity Fair was also involved in the Ridley Scott production. And they made a big kind of hoo-ha of, oh, we've gone to a lot of effort to get the training right and all the rest of it. But for me, you can sort of excuse what happens in Vanity Fair because it happens within a context of Vanity Fair in the same way that if you decided to reproduce the entirety of Les Miserables and you stuck in yeah. a Waterloo scene, then you could kind of go with that. And so in the context of Vanity Fair, Waterloo feels like an excuse to kill off some key characters. And you see that particularly when um, one British unit is on its way to catch a bra and then somehow gets mugged by French cavalry. And there's a lot of sort of head scratching and you sort of, hmm, okay then. But yeah. um, I, I don't think you can unless you're going to do an entire episode. Yeah, on it. yeah. I, I, I think I did see. I, I didn't watch that series, but I, I'm pretty sure I've, I've seen the battle scene, and it was, it was okay. Mm. Again, we've got the 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 Cutterbra quandary. What what the hell happens at Cutterbra? It just seems to confuse the hell out of people. At least Sharp tried to mm-hmm. give some idea that, that there was this this battle, um, but. Oh, I suppose if we're looking at TV, there's there's a French contribution, which is I've got I've got it here, this thing, which I I think is about it it it's later than later than Sharp. It's two thousand and one, and this is a a, a TV series. Um, uh, I think this is five hours and fifty five minutes. So this is up there with Abel Gans and um, and Ridley Scott's. Well, Ridley Scott's had a, a piddling four hours when he hits TV screens. Um, this is this has got um, Christian Clavier as as Napoleon, a pretty good Napoleon actually. Uh, it's got Gerard Depardieu and Isabella Rossellini as Josephine. Um, John Malkovich, I think, is Talleyrand. So it's got a, a pretty good cast. However. And I, I did sit through this. I, I, I have very, very, very poor French. And um, I bought this and it's got no subtitles. It's purely in French. And I sat through all nearly six hours of it just to get through it. And I, I thought like that scene in uh, The 13th Warrior where Antonio Banderas picks up, picks up Norse um, just through hearing it spoken. Um, and I thought that was going to happen to me, but it did not. It didn't turn me into Maurice Chevalier. But nonetheless, it's it's interesting. But then I discovered that there is the English version, English language version on YouTube in its entirety. So viewers, I would recommend you visit that rather than my DVD. But Waterloo appears in it. And um, it's it's not great. Um, again, there is confusion about Ligny and uh, Cotterabra. Um the the battle scenes are fairly confused. There's just a lot of running around the cavalry charge. It, it's it's I'm I'm about to say something really stupid, but it seems quite easy to make men on horses, um, though though women as extras are quite often in these movies. We should mention that um, look spectacular um, because the, the 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 charges do. But there's some the uniform. I'm no expert on uniforms. Um, and the uniforms are dreadful. The Highlanders look atrocious. Their kilts look like tea towel, tartan tea towels just wrapped around their waist, you know, bath towels. Absolutely atrocious. There's an air of sort of school nativities, you know, you sit the tea towel over your head and then yeah. suddenly you're looking like a shepherd kind of thing. Yeah. And, and the, you know, the, the plumes that they've got look nylon, just really cheap. They've, They've, they've obviously spent all of the money on their, on their stars and the, the, the locations for the, the historical bits where people are in posh rooms talking and salons and such like all look great. The battle is just, it's just a spare part. Um, it's, you know, when I, when I, when I first said that Ridley Scott's was the worst depiction of Waterloo, 
it probably is because it's just way out there wrong. At least this is just a confused mess and with crap costumery. Um, but that, again, demonstrates that TV isn't very good at doing Waterloo. Um, so I, I don't know what conclusion we, we draw from this. I, we, did, we did find, it's a, it's a film I'm, I'm quite fond of, um, from the mid-70s called Day of the Locusts, or Day of the Locust, singular. And it's about 1930s Hollywood. So it goes, harks back to some of these early epics we've been looking at. And it's about an artist who goes in as a, as a kind of scene painter and set designer, which again, strikes a lot of chords with what we've been looking at with these early films. And he gets involved in all sorts of things. And directed by John Schlesinger, and I think it's William Atherton who plays the main character, who's not, not the best known actor, but you'd recognize him if you saw him. It's actually the film from which the name Homer Simpson comes from. Homer Simpson is one of the characters, and I believe they're based on the, 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 the Homer Simpson we know and, and don't necessarily love. Um, but there is, there is a scene in this um, which is quite spectacular, and I, I'm delighted it's on YouTube, and I hope you're going to put it in oh, here. Yes. Because it sums up, I think, a lot of certainly um, two things, really. Um, digging holes at, on the field at Waterloo, but also how catastrophically earthquake bad depictions can be, because what you have is... Jesus Christ, what the hell are you doing? because what you have is a scene from a film about Waterloo being shot on a, on a, a big lot, um, on a soundstage, and it's been built. The slope, Wellington slope, has been built artificially, so there's lots of wooden scaffolding with the slope with troops on it. And what, what happens is that basically this thing isn't safe. We see a big pile of hazard signs which have been removed, and the director's screaming through a megaphone, and it looks quite good. You can see a sunken way in the background. And I, I think you've got Highlanders. Every depiction of Waterloo has to have Highlanders. Of course they do. Um, quite rightly. And um, and uh, I have to keep reminding my friends in the Coldstream Guards that the Scots Guards were actually at Hoopermall. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the inevitable happens and it collapses in the most catastrophic way. And actors are falling through this this set and our, our hero, um, the, the set designer, I, I can't remember whether he's responsible for it, but he looks on aghast at the scene of disaster. It doesn't, it, it, there's, a, there's an initial collapse and then it collapses again. And you're thinking, oh, has, are people being killed in this? But I, I, I think as a metaphor for, <laughs> for what we've been discussing, we can't do any better than the Day of the Locust from 1975. And I, I'll, I'll shut up there, I think. There's a pleasing kind of circularity to bring everything sort of full circle to massive holes in films. Um, Tony, it's been an absolutely fascinating discussion. Lord knows how I'm going to cut this for the final <laughs> version. Um, Four hours. Yeah, we, we've been going some. 
um, to, to put this together. But just remind people, first of all, about the book that you mentioned. Um, the, oh, yes, this to... is Hervé Dumont's Napoleon, an Epic in a Thousand Films, which is available in the doorstop French version. But I think much of the text is actually on that um, website, which is, paraphrase it, Encyclopedia of Historic Film. We can put the link, I'm sure, on the on the uh, on the screen but uh fascinating and and well worth looking at i've only scratched the surface with it i'm sure there are more films with waterloo in it and certainly a thousand things with with wellington in them no with the uh, wellington no we haven't got many wellington biopics our, our solitary the iron duke, the seems iron duke. To maybe we're overdue but uh, i mean this was the debate that we we had um should you go for another wellington biopic or are there just actually better stories to tell and my money as I have said countless times, and I make no apologies for boring people with this again, is that you don't go for a Wellington biopic, you do the Marshall's Wives. And I'm sick the number of times that I've been trying to trying to get people to do some big kind of sky TV yep. history docudrama thing, so like they did for the royal family, pre World War One. It would be call it the Marshall's Wives Tale. That's my working title. Yeah. It would be fabulous. I, I want in on that. Um, I could be the Sam Marks on that one. We'll start casting immediately. Sounds good. There we go. Right. Um, okay. If somebody well, wants to bung us a couple of million quid to make it happen, um, I'll, I'll happily take the check. <laughs> no, I think we're looking at 200 million, actually. Well, yes, but Let's 2 do it million properly. will be a start. Get anyway, that, thank you for lending me an ear because I, I, did, I did need to um, sound off about some of that. But I, hopefully it's been constructive as opposed to just slagging off. Um, which, as we've said, is low-hanging fruit. It certainly has. Professor Tony Pollard, it's been an absolute joy to talk to you. Uh, we need to have a, a chat at some point about more of your work for Waterloo Uncovered, which is a fantastic charity. Folks, I would urge you to check out the link in the description. They're an amazing organisation doing a lot of work in veteran rehabilitation, in part through archaeology, but providing much wider support for service personnel who've given so much and suffered so much in the course of that selfless service. Link in the description, please do follow through. Tony, a joy to talk to you. Thank you so much for your time. As ever, Zach. Hello folks, if you're new here, remember to hit that subscribe button and the like button so that you can find your way back. And if you're loving the show, particularly if you're listening to this on the podcast version, remember to leave a review. They make a massive difference in boosting the show up the algorithms to the tune of hundreds of places. So please do take the time to just leave a few words to give your reactions on the show and help this podcast reach a wider audience. Much love to all of my Patreon supporters. Shout outs to my mentioned in Dispatches patrons, Rob Griffith, Brendan Teeling, Beatrice de Graff, Lynn Dawson, Lucy Tatner, Jim Deary, Josh Keeney, Colin Fieldhouse, Stephen Coulson, Jim Getz, Stephen Gillen, Hugh Brennan, Alistair Campbell-Greve, Andy Meakin, Mark Anscombe, Rob Coughlin, Bruins Girl, Noah Fink, Mark Trowbridge, Mars Reedy, Nick Overland, uh, Graham Goodwin, Chris Pramus, Anthony Gumbau, Anonymous American, Martin Pisani, Auric Ducado, James Fluick, Roger O'Donnell, Na blah, 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 blah. Natasha Hobday, Rod Schrager, Chris Kimball, Gary Dennis, David Graylick, Ted Andrews, David Malinsky, Richard Anderson, Arthur Forgey, Sam Moore, Wyatt Pollock, Carol Dixon Smith, Roland Shark, and Jason Morn. And the Admirals, John Haynes, Ryan Diamond, JC Kaiser, Bob Burnham, Mike Guest, Liam Telfer, Todd and Laird Campbell, Graham Swidenbank, Rachel Stark, Mark Duckers, David Maxwell, David Priest, Graham Callister, Sean Sullivan, Stephen Ashworth, Dan Hazelwood, Kate Wilcom, Steve Carter, Clemens, Charles McKay, Reto the Sci-Fi Fan, and Tim Day. I'll be back very soon, but until then, I'm Zach White. This has been the Napoleonic Wars pod. Take care of yourselves, my friends. Stay well. Stay safe and thank you for listening.